Good morning. Thank you all for coming. Today is World Teachers Day, a day proclaimed by the United Nations in 1994 to honor the work of teachers as a sign of respect for the teaching profession and to highlight teachers' concerns and priorities. And this is exactly what we're here to do today. What are those concerns? On World Teachers Day, what is it that BC teachers have to tell you? Teachers know the needs of the children in their classrooms. We work with children every day. We understand their learning needs. Teachers have the expertise, the knowledge, the training, and the experience to articulate those needs, and that voice must be respected. We are saying through our job action that we no longer have the conditions we need in our classrooms to allow us to meet our students' needs. BC students have been waiting for the support and learning conditions they need for far too long. Teachers have stretched and stretched, trying to patch up the system, to cover for the underfunding, the lack of resources, the instability, and the uninformed policy decisions for far too long. This World Teachers Day, BC teachers are saying enough is enough. What have BC teachers fa faced in this week alone, this week of World Teachers Day? We've seen the employer, BCPC, strategizing about ways to put pressure on teachers put pressure on teachers. Where have these people been? Clearly not in classrooms. Teachers have been under tremendous pressure for a decade. We've struggled to do our best for students despite oversized classes, fewer and fewer learning specialist teachers, and less and less support for students with special needs. That is why we've been forced to undertake this job action in the first place. We've seen the minister announcing a new scheme, the Class Organization Fund, a scheme that would see teachers and parents competing with each other for funding to support students with special needs, trying to prove that one child is more worthy than another. A scheme with no new funding this year and with not even a tenth of what is needed next year. We've used, we've, we used to have firm guarantees that generated the funding and conditions all students needed. These were guarantees of services to students with special needs, but also guarantees of services to ESL students and access to counseling and teacher librarian services. These were guarantees that teachers had bargained for at their own expense, at the expense of gains for themselves. These go government this government erased these guarantees through legislation that has since been declared unconstitutional, illegal. Rather than sidestepping its responsibility with half measures that pits, pit the needs of one student against the needs of another, the government should be putting the conditions back in BC schools so students have universal access to the learning conditions they need. And we've seen the government announcing plans to modernize public education, claiming teachers are using 20th century methods, a government apparently in denial about the decade of underfunding and disastrous policy decisions that have marked the 21st century in education in BC so far. Again, where have they been? Teachers have been crying out for funding to match the needs of this century for decades. We've been desperately fundraising, working in late night casinos, selling chocolate bars and holding book fairs to raise the funds necessary to bring technology into schools. Experimenting with our students' future is not the answer. Creating stability and putting adequate funding and support in place is. All of this points to a government and employer who are out of touch with the reality of today's classrooms, the challenges teachers face, and the amazing work teachers do. What is the reality? I have with me today George Sira from Maple Ridge, who will be talking about uh, the reality in secondary classrooms, and Chris Harris 
from uh, Vancouver Elementary School Teachers Association, who will be talking about the reality in elementary classrooms in this province. And we'll start with Chris. Uh, thanks very much. I'm very happy to be here today. And I'd like to start off by uh, acknowledging the great work of teachers, classroom teachers, resource teachers, counselors, uh, teacher psychologists, teacher librarians, speech and language pathologists, and all other teacher specialists um, for the work that they do every day with their students. I'm going to start off with a little analogy. Um, every parent really does understand, I think, negotiating class size because every parent that I've met has thrown a birthday party. Are they a good negotiator? Well, hopefully, because most children would have everyone they have ever met come to their birthday party. How many kids can you handle? Do you have any help? Are you doing it all by yourself? Are children coming with food allergies? How are you going to handle that? Very crafty parents might try to contract out these services. Teachers have arrived at school to find a cake and goodie bags on their desks with a little thank you card. Now every September, since the government passed Bill 33, we have seen the report on the organization of schools. In Vancouver, I'll have it right here, it's a very thick document, but it still doesn't contain all the classes in our school district. Just the classes that violate Section 76 of the School Act. This year, over 1,000 secondary classes and 82 elementary classes. Classes that would not necessarily exist if Christy Clark had not illegally stripped our collective agreement in 2002. My background is teaching kindergarten to grade three. I can tell you that four and five year olds that enter kindergarten generally do so with a great deal of enthusiasm. Teachers do their best to prepare, but there's a reason why the two hardest things in kindergarten is September and October. These young students come in with a variety of interests, experiences and needs and those needs are not always known in the beginning. The kindergarten teacher is the first to see learning difficulties and often the first to start a process of seeking additional support and resources for students who need it. Often due to budgetary constraints and enormous wait listing for testing, those students that a teacher has identified as requiring extra support aren't officially given a designation until grade three, four, or even later. So while this document is a thick one, it could be very much thicker. Last week, on my way out of a local bargaining session, I stopped by one of our inner city schools to see the teachers there. I met with one grade one, two teacher in his classroom, and I asked how his class was this year. Oh, he said, I have six designated students this year, but I'm used to it. You could see the clenching of the jaw and hear the tension in the voice. This is a teacher who has taught for 15 years, but I knew this would be a challenging year. No teacher can handle that many needs in one classroom by himself without extensive supports, and those had virtually all been stripped and cut from our schools over the last 10 years. There was a time that this class would not have been allowed to be organized in this way. Teachers had negotiated reasonable limits to the class size and class composition, limits and protections for students with special needs, to ensure that classrooms and resource rooms were appropriate for student learning. Christy Clark took all that away with a stroke of a pen. Imagine a grade seven classroom with 29 students, seven of those students designated as students with special needs. I find it hard to believe that this would be an environment appropriate for student learning. I wish it wasn't true, but it is a reality in Vancouver and I'm sure in many other districts around the province. So, on World Teachers Day, I asked you to think not only about the individual teacher in the classroom, but the public education system in general. I want a system that does justice to every single student and every single teacher. Computers, smart boards, and tablets are all great tools, but nothing will replace the interactions between a teacher and a student that ensures real learning takes place. I want parents in Vancouver to know that we have the best teachers in the world, they can be confident that they have a great teacher in front of their child, but we are asking for a little bit of help. Thank you, and happy World Teachers Day. And George Sierra is here from Maple Ridge, president of the Maple Ridge Teachers, and he'll be talking about secondary schools. Thank you, Susan. Um, Maple Ridge Teachers definitely um, 
thank the BCTF for allowing their story to be told as well today. Um, in terms of the secondary situation, um, that becomes an extremely difficult one because you've all heard about um, the Bill 33 and the limits that are there, but in secondary schools, um, we have many, many, many thousands of classrooms above what Bill 33 uh, will say is the limits with either three identified students or 30 kids per class. Um, the story I want to tell is uh, coming out of one of our high schools that um, is extremely concerned with their classes at the secondary level, but concerned uh, beyond simply just uh, the learning that occurs in their classrooms. The concerns actually are now starting to manifest itself in terms of uh, safety concerns. So I'm going to start with uh, reading um, an email that I received last week from a secondary shop teacher. I'd like to describe, this is an email he sent to our office and also communicated um, to his administrators so they are well aware at the school of these concerns. I'd like to describe a snapshot of the classroom conditions here in the metal shop this year. The main message I am trying to communicate is that the composition of my classes are not properly supported by the current resources. This year is my fourth year teaching shop classes and some of my students will have been with me two, three and four years now. I am thrilled with the development and skills that the returning students have and the potential that they possess. At the same time that I feel excitement for them, I have a quickly growing concern and frustration for the education of every student I am working with, whether first year or fourth with me, whether ministry identified or not. This school year is the most challenging for me to meet the educational needs, beginners or advanced, of each of my students for two reasons. First, I have an unmanageable combination of coded, ESL, uncoded, but very needy students in my classes. I define unmanageable to mean my ability to meet the educational needs of my students to reach their full potential, as is the intention of the ministry IRPs. These students require close attention, me or a student education assistant within a 10-foot radius, and frequent instruction, correction, to conduct the lessons and their endeavors. Secondly, many students who are returning students, coded or not, are very strong in this subject area and also require personal or one-to-one -one attention instruction in order to keep them engaged, excited about shop classes, and continually building skills through challenging learning activities. These are the students who I have to jump out of the way of when they get an idea and the passion that they show it's fun to watch. These students also require much attention because of the level of their skill and challenging projects they are choosing to take on. The alternative is to ignore their needs and restrict what they can pursue because of the makeup of the classroom. These two reasons describe two unique groups of students, both with very high needs for completely different reasons. Both groups are equally deserving of my support and are with me at the same time. I'm finding it overwhelming and saddening because I can envision the quality of education they could be receiving if the class composition better suited each group's needs or the shop had the necessary resources to offer the students the education they deserve. Today, I came very close to shutting down the work period because I didn't feel completely comfortable in my ability to ensure a safe workplace for every student. At the same time I was considering this, I knew that if I were to take away the student's opportunity to work, I would be taking away one of their favorite reasons for being in school for many of them. I also have to contemplate the result of me shutting things down and then having a, or not shutting things down and then having a student get hurt as a result and having to deal with the stress of that scenario. As it turned out today, I continued the work period, no student got hurt, and everyone, everything goes on like normal, but not so. Because after today, I have decided I must adjust the function of my classes because I can't feel that every student will always be safe with the current student composition and SEA support. I believe I will need to reduce their work time available and restrict the hands-on learning opportunities students have normally gotten in past school years. 
There will certainly be fallout from this change, but at least my students will be safe. I'd rather feel the hurt of knowing the education they are missing, even if students and parents don't know, than dealing with a student getting seriously hurt in class. So this particular teacher goes on to talk about the resources that they need, and we are working with the school district to try to implement those. But the frustrating part for our school district and for us in Maple Ridge, of course, is what will happen is the school district will do what they can to put supports in place but those supports are limited and it will be taking the supports probably from another classroom, another situation where they're needed to put into this situation because of you know, the apparent needs. So that was the shop class. Nowhere near as long, but I've had communication from two other secondary teachers with similar stories. This one comes from the um, senior foods classes and she writes, I too have classes where I fear for the student's safety and my mental health. So much so that I have decided that every time the class will be cooking, six students will have to sit out and do written work. How fun does that? How fun does that sound? Not much of a reason to take foods class. This all results from no one listening to our concern about a lab class having class size of 24, which is what we used to have. Instead, 30 students have been literally stuffed into my classroom in four of my blocks. Include in this the number of high percentage of coded and ESL kids, and you have a recipe for disaster. I always look forward to the cooking portion of teaching foods, but this year I'm actually dreading the start of it next week. And my last story comes from textiles. This teacher writes, she had uh, had to step out of her class for a minute to deal with uh, a couple of behavior issues and when she walked back into the class, this is what she described. I returned to my class to find out that two other students had taken scissors and had been carving into the sewing machines for fun. In the 17 years I have been at this school, I have never feared for student safety. With this class I do. Someone is going to get hurt, plain and simple. There is no enjoyment for me and anyone in this room when these students um, are behaving in this manner with absolutely no supports in this class. So those are three stories. But like Chris, I also have a binder full of uh, classrooms that violate the, the legislation with Bill 33. So the final piece I'd like to say um, is that in Maple Ridge, we're actually extremely fortunate because our school district does everything they can. They really do. They try and support the teachers. We currently have a school board that is very supportive, but at the end of the day, uh, we all agree it's not enough. There's absolutely not enough funding to cover the needs in the school district. Thank you. So in conclusion, in other places, politicians recognize and respect the work teachers do. Just last week, the new Premier of Alberta, Alison Redford, announced her intention of reversing cuts to education funding in that province to the tune of $107 million, saying predictable and sustainable education funding promises parents, teachers, and school boards, and most importantly, our students, that Alberta will retain one of the best educational systems in the world. On World Teachers Day, BC teachers have a clear message for government and for our employers. Here it is. Teachers have never stopped doing our part, never wavered in our de dedication to students and public education despite the many obstacles you've put in our path. But enough is enough. It's time for you to step up and do your share. Put the necessary funding, teacher services, and support in place. Students, teachers, and public schools have been waiting far too long. Thank you. <laughs>